The model of the atom proposed by Rutherford was a drastic change from the way atoms had been visualized previously. The atoms were considered solid spheres with their mass spread evenly throughout each atom. Rutherford's model, on the other hand, predicted that more than 99% of the mass of the atom was concentrated in less than 1% of the volume available to the atom. There was, however, the troubling prediction that electromagnetic radiation would be given off by the electron as it circled the nucleus. This would cause the atom, visualized by Rutherford, to self-destruct. A contemporary of Rutherford, Niels Bohr, was able to refine Rutherford's model. Bohr kept all the features of the Rutherford model and explained how the electron could stay in orbit around the nucleus. But he added some restrictions to Rutherford's model. He stated that electrons did not have the freedom to move in any orbit at all but that only certain energy levels or orbits were allowed. While in these orbits, electrons would not radiate energy. Furthermore, for an electron to get from a lower energy level to a higher energy level, it had to absorb just the right amount of energy from another source, such as a free electron, or a photon of electromagnetic radiation. In returning from a higher energy level to a lower one, Bohr suggested that the electron would give up a photon of electromagnetic radiation, which had an amount of energy exactly equaling the energy difference between the two energy levels. Bohr initially worked with the hydrogen atom and he was successful in predicting and explaining a number of its properties, including a mathematical relationship that predicted what its spectrum would look like when the atom is excited. In hydrogen, a single proton is located in the nucleus and a single electron orbits the nucleus. The protons and electron exert equal and opposite forces of electrostatic attraction on each other. Two oppositely charged objects, a distance apart, have electrical potential energy because a force must be exerted to keep them apart. If released from rest, they will accelerate towards each other changing the stored energy to kinetic energy. However, if the electron is in motion around the nucleus at just the right speed, then the force of attraction exerted on it by the nucleus is just great enough to cause the electron to move in a circular path around the nucleus. If the force were smaller, the electron would move away from the nucleus. If the force were any greater, then the electron would spiral into the nucleus. Since the electron is in motion, it possesses kinetic energy, in addition to potential energy. It was reasoned that as well as a circular orbit, an electron could also follow an elliptical orbit. In an elliptical orbit, the electron does not travel at a constant speed, but goes faster when it is near the nucleus and slower when it is far away. The kinetic and potential energy both change as an electron goes around the nucleus in an elliptical orbit. The distance from the nucleus is constantly changing, and the speed of the electron is also constantly changing. So, when the kinetic energy gets bigger, the potential energy must get smaller, and vice versa, so that the total energy remains constant. 
All of these ideas could be applied to other elements besides hydrogen. Bohr's model of the helium atom consisted of a nucleus with two positive charges and two electrons orbiting the nucleus, with each electron having the same total energy. For lithium, the model envisioned a nucleus with a charge of plus three, with two electrons in equal energy orbits near the nucleus, and a third electron with a larger energy in what was referred to as the second energy level. In a similar manner, the Bohr model was used to predict the arrangement of electrons for many of the elements in the periodic table. Sodium with 11 electrons has, according to this model, two electrons in the first energy level, eight electrons in the second energy level, and one in the third. Potassium has two electrons in the first energy level, eight more in the second level, eight more in the third level, and one in the fourth level. These arrangements become difficult to draw, and so they may be represented in a simpler way. Potassium may be represented like this, even though Bohr visualized it like this. It soon became apparent that elements with similar properties also had similar electron arrangements. Lithium, sodium, and potassium all have one electron in the outer energy level. All three elements are soft metals. When these metals are exposed to air, they corrode in a few seconds. There are three more elements which are also metals and behave in the same way. Rubidium, cesium, francium. If we list all of these elements on a chart, the number of electrons in the outer level is directly related to the chemical properties of the elements. Also, it seems that there is a maximum number of electrons that can occupy a certain energy level. If this level can have as many as 18 electrons, it is clear that in some cases, a level does not fill up before the next level begins to fill up. In the same way, this level can accept up to 32 electrons, but neither of these two elements have filled this orbit before adding electrons at higher levels. Other elements can be grouped in patterns this way to help explain chemical similarities in the periodic table. With his concept of energy levels, Bohr saved Rutherford's atomic model. It was a dramatic advance in our understanding of the atom.